Um, okay, so, so how many of you would call yourselves um, search engine experts? Okay, that's good. I'm talking to the right crowd. Um, in this talk, I'm not going to give you any silver bullets at all because I basically don't have any. Um, search engine optimization is a black magic, and um, I'm going to talk a lot about my mistakes, probably um, a little bit more frankly than I should. Um, I do promise that you'll have a lot of fun and um, that I'll help you see the mistakes that I made so maybe you won't make them yourself. But first, let's talk a little bit about Search Engine 101. So when you type something into Google, um, when you're wondering what's going to come out on top, there's, there's a simple formula, and that's importance times relevance. And importance is all about something called page rank. And page rank is, is not named after the web page. It's named after a guy named Larry Page, who built an algorithm that Google now uses. And it basically means um, it's going to take the um, the number of links from other important sites, and it's going to pass a share of that link, um, of that page rank to you. And um, pages with higher page rank um, are go going to, all other things being equal, appear higher. Um, you'll hear this talked about as, as PR. If you've got the Google toolbar, there's a little green bar, or if it's all white, that means you don't have any page rank at all. Um, that's, that's in the middle of the bar, but that's the importance, and we're not going to talk much about that in this talk because this is primarily a public relations thing, right? If you get a couple of links from the New York Times, then, then um, you know, on the front page of the New York Times, you're probably good. If, if, um, or you can get like um, 150,000 page rank one links. What we're really going to focus on is, is relevance, and that's actually what's on the page and what that's going to do to your um, search engine optimization. Um, so this is really the framework side. The other side is really the public relations side. And there's a little bit of crossover, but that's basically um, how, how it goes. How many of you were in my talk last year? OK, great. So this is a lemming. And we talked a lot about the, the idea that um, some frameworks develop these fanatical followers um, you know, we just got a dog, or, or another example is, is there's a guy up on our street that will walk his three dogs and a goat. And all the neighborhood kids would, would feed the goat anything, right? Um, Dad, this goat will eat anything. And then I'll ask, yes, but should that goat be eating, eating anything? And, I mean, you've known Java developers like that would, that would, that would try anything, um, you know, from XML to configuration to JSPs to EJBs, and we're much better than that, right? Well, no, we've got our fanatical followers too. In fact, any commercially successful framework has to have a core of leaders and has to have that broad base of fanatical followers. That's what makes the ecosystem work. That's, that's how we can get jobs that pay. That's how we can have a critical mass to have a conference. Um, and some of those things that we follow make a lot of sense, and some of them don't. I heard that Dave talked a lot about that this morning. But some of these things are going to have a profound impact on, on places that, you know, the framework doesn't express a strong opinion. Let me give you an example, and everybody's going to know it when they see it. Yeah, this is actual scaffolding, and, and it's actually being used from what I understand. And if, if you've heard, seen my talks before, you know that I think that scaffolding is of critical importance in the Rails community because that's, that's often the first example of Rails application code that anybody ever sees. And, you know, other frameworks have their examples too. Java had what? Anybody know? Yeah, pet store, right? We've got our scaffolding. And it's going to have a pretty dramatic effect on your search engine optimization. In fact, in the first couple of years of Rails, this is what your um, URLs look like, right? Show 9923. That's your, that's your dog's name to the search engine. And now it looks much better, you know, with the RESTful routes and everything. 
Um, but if you think about it, this, this ID that's on the end of all of our URLs, it's, it's baked into the default migrations, it's baked into the default routes, and even the redirects, which means that every link in the system that uses those routes um, by default has this behavior. And I know that a lot of Rails people, um, myself included, and, and you know, back as early as a couple of years ago, believed that if you build this kick-ass application, then smart people will, will just work hand over fist to, to find your application and use it. But that's not the typical user. This is the typical user. This is either my mom the driver or some random picture from the internet. You know, you can decide which one. And my mom is, is an interesting driver because she's had pretty bad neck problems. So she's got this massive mirror in the middle of the car so that she could see what's going on behind her. She's got a mirror that's almost as big that, uh, oh gosh, it's like, it's like driving with a billboard beside you um, out, out the other side um, so that she can tell what's going on behind her. But if you look to the right, there's no mirror at all. And that's because she can't turn her neck to the right. She has to turn her whole body. So she tries to devise a route from place to place where she can only make left-hand turns. The thing is that my mom doesn't see herself like this. She sees herself like this. You know, there was this time when, um, when she got her little Corolla bumped by a beer truck, and she got mad, and she just tore off after this beer truck, after he you know, left the scene of the accident. So he's whipping through Memphis. She's whipping through Memphis right on his tail, and she kind of corners him at the 7-Eleven where he's dropping off his beer. He probably just didn't know she was back there. And then got, it, got in um, his face, and, and this big burly guy was so flabbergasted that he pulls out his driver's license, registration, and insurance. And um, so, so she doesn't see herself as someone with limitations but she doesn't always see all the signs, and she doesn't always make the prudent choice. So um, to bring this back to an SEO talk, you need lots of obvious signs. Okay? So when I'm building a page, when I want to crank up relevance, I use the tools that are most important to me. That's at, at the top, the URL is probably the most important thing you could do. That should have the keyword that you're linking to. Um, and then the page title should have, the, should have it. You should have a single H1 tag with, with, the, um, with the words that you're trying to crank up the relevance for. And then there are a couple other things. Um, but this is the way that you ought to view the Google bots. You know, is my mom the driver, not some super intelligent thing that's going to divine the purpose of your site. You shouldn't view your users as someone... As, as people that are going to go out of your way to find your blog and read about what you're posting and then go find your site, um, you need lots of just brain-dead, obvious signs. Um, usually the more the better, but you know, you can, you can, if you're trying to game the search engine, you're going to get yourself in trouble. But going back to the default Rails implementation, you know, we've all got this map resources, and for us, we've got a plant application. It's a gardening application. And then we've got um, somewhere in the views, there's an H2 tag um, that, that links to, um, you know, I've got the title, which is good, right? That shows the, the relevance. But I completely missed the boat in terms of the URL that I'm pointing to. So another thing that I could do here is I can drop in a title tag, and that can increase my relevance. But what I really need is, um, is a smarter URL. And there are a couple of ways to solve this problem that are interesting to me. Um, one way is the idea that, that a lot of blogs use, especially in the rail space. They use something called a slug or a permalink, which is um, nothing more than a smart title that's only created once. Um, the first time that you create the object, maybe it'll grab it from the title of the blog, and it, it'll drop that slug in there. And, um, but the problem with this kind of approach is that it, you have to um, let go of some of the conventions of Rails. And every time that you let go of the conventions, um, it takes you a little bit closer to hell, doesn't it? So um, there's also a problem with this approach that I might misspell the name of my dog Spot, right? Instead of that P-O, I might accidentally type L-U, right? Here, slut, here, slut. And I might not notice that until, you know, I see that, gosh, there's this page rank seven page of my dog slut. 
And so when it's time to change, when it's time to um, improve the SEO, or when I notice a mistake, I can't, I can't have a commercial site with, with the dog named Slut. So I need to, cor to correct that permalink. What happens to my page rank? Well, I'll lose it all. So here, I don't really have enough information to, um, to, ha to maintain all of those incoming links. So one of the things that I can do is I can use the fuller path and actually have some redundancy. And in this case, I think the redundancy is OK. Um, so I have the ID, and then I tack on a title on the end of that. And so I actually do the lookup based on the ID, and the title is for, for Google. And that's not a bad solution, and I've actually seen this applied a couple of times. The solution that I like is to actually change the way that um, the object itself is parameterized. Because a Rails URL, by default, is what you see on the top. It's the site name plus the pluralized form of the controller. For my application, it's plants. And then there's the object, and then a two-param call to that object. That two-param call, by default, returns an ID. Well, Opie Fernandez. Um, posted a really cool blog post on one way to handle this problem, where you override that two-param, and then you have the ID, which is an integer, and then a hyphen, and then whatever you want to put over there. In this case, I put either the, the common name, or I put the common name of my plant, right? In other places, I might use the, the common name or the botanical name. And the cool thing about this is that if you, what happens when you call 2i on this thing? Well, you're just going to get the ID, right? So, um, and that happens by default on the, um, on the finders because we're coming from a string anyway. So this is going to work by default with just about everything you do except for, um, except for find by ID, right? If I'm doing something like find by ID, I have to um, tack the 2i on the end. So um, this gets you most of the way there from a URL perspective. Now let's, um, let's switch gears to the page title, not because it's a hard problem to solve, but because I think that this is an interesting problem um, in that we can become too dogmatic and we can overthink this. So um, what's interesting is that a page title really looks and smells like a view type problem, but a lot of us would prefer to solve this problem in the controller. And the reason is that there's this rule that's been kind of hammered into our heads that you set instance variables in the controller for the consumption of the view. Um, to me, that doesn't smell quite right, so I kind of break that rule. So in the, um, in the layout itself, which is really the problem, right? It's, it's the, um, you want to set this data in the, in the metadata, which appears in the layout and not the typical body of the view. So in the layout, um, I just grab the instance variable, um, and if nothing's set there, then I just tack on dig the dirt, which is the name of the site. Um, in the view, I just call a helper method called page title, and um, I can put pass into that whatever ever I want it to. And then the layout itself, that's where I set an instance variable. Again, if you're thinking about the standard Rails conventions, this smells kind of wrong, but if you look about the usage pattern in the view, well, it looks pretty cool. So the last thing I want to talk about here is the idea that images are a very rich source for SEO because you can really crank up your keyword density this way. And so this is a, a good example of how, um, of, of an early application um, where I really wasn't paying attention to SEO at all. Um, I have the, um, the, the picture model ID and then I have something that um, I basically replace the inbound user um, file name, which would have been richer for SEO, by the way, right? So, but in order to keep from converting that and to keep it normalized, I replaced it with user underscore. And then, you know, whichever thumbnail size gets passed. And then um, the Rails image tag picks up as, as a default that um, an, alternate, um, an alternate by default. What, what I should be doing is using everything that I can to, to load that image tag and point it to something important. So the alt tag should be actually the person's name. And actually, it would probably be better for me um, to, to preserve the user's name, and I could get some keyword richness that I hadn't really anticipated before. Um, the SRC tag is, is um, if, if I'm using a smart file name, that's going to work in my favor. 
I can pick up a title attribute and, and I can make that go away with CSS if I want to, but that's also going to add, um, add to the keyword density. And if I want to, I can multiply the effects by adding a link to that and I get the, um, the SRC attribute and the alt um, tag of, or, or the title tag on the link as well. So um, images can be an incredibly effective um, kicker for your SEO. And this is probably a mistake that I made um, you know, way more often than I should have. Um, I would use Ajax pretty liberally in our user interface, and I would completely lop off huge pieces of my application that, that Google, Google could no longer find. So there are two problems with, with coding a style of Ajax that doesn't degrade gracefully. Um, the first one is reachability. If Google can't see it, um, well, you've got a picture of a tree falling in a forest with nobody hearing it. You could have a beautiful application with nobody to use it. Um, but the other problem is a little bit more subtle. If I use a lot of Ajax, it's not always easy for a user to build a link. And that link is how you're going to get your page rank built. So you have to do things explicitly to let users build links to specific um, content on your site. So um, a couple of things I want to, a couple of solutions that I want to talk about before we move on to faceted nav. First thing is a sitemap. With heavy Ajax applications, a sitemap really becomes a must. And really, it's just a, an XML file called sitemap.xml. There's a very standard template for it, and Google has it, and all the major search engines do. Um, and essentially, all you're doing is building an XML template. You dump in the URLs, priorities for those URLs, and timestamps of when they last change. And you know, as Rails developers, most of, most of us have that information captured in the updated at, um, attribute anyway. So at least Google can see everything, um, even though this approach won't pass the page rank. And that's, that's pretty important, right? So if you want people to be able to link to you, um, look to the Google Maps API. If you look all the way into the upper right, there's this, this button called Link. Um, and if you click it, this provides a non-Ajax way to reach this precise page. And that's pretty cool. That, that allows that, so this is a feature that's great for search engine optimization and great for users at the same time. And that's, that's pretty much ideal. And um, gosh, this is what um, the lake looked like, what, that would be about a year ago now, wouldn't it? <laughs> that's Lake Travis, and this is the oasis, like right over here, and you know, that's, that's home. OK, so the last thing that you can think about is building two versions of the content, one for your users and one for Google. Now, at first blush, this, this seems like a very radical thing to do. But this is precisely what a lot of us are doing um, as we've gone to the jQuery API or the more modern implementation, um, implementations of the prototype API. We start with, with a hard link, and then we code the regular implementation. And then we layer on the Ajax um, so that this thing de degrades gracefully. That's two versions of the same content. Now, what we did for Dig the Dirt, since, since we really didn't know how Google was going to handle our fast nav, and we, we really wanted to be able to, um, to tweak it and, and, um, and, and see where, where Google would take it, we had a link at the bottom of the page that said JavaScript free version. And really what I was saying was Google click me please, right? In our faceted navigation, Google could kind of um, wind through that. And we could see what Google was doing with it. And um, so I left my Ajax implementation to something that was not accessible. And um, we'll talk about how this played out. OK, so this first section, what you want to remember is when you think relevance, think um, you know, smart URLs, page titles, and single H1. And make smart use of your pictures and links. And be smart with your Ajax. OK. Are you guys just dying to know what this bullet's going to be about? Racist navigation? So um, has anybody heard the story, by the way? Anybody guess about what it's going to be about? OK, that's good. That's good. It's kind of an obscure one. Um, 
but faceted navigation, um, so how many of you have seen faceted navigation? Probably a lot of you, huh? Ah, a pretty new idea, good. So faceted navigation is basically about letting your user query for data in multiple dimensions. If you bought a Nike shoe, um, then, then you've used faceted navigation. Um, so it would ask you, you know, which shoe size do you want? Um, you could click on, you know, what sport are you playing? And you can do this in any order. So I'm going to shift gears a little bit and show you what we're doing on Dig the Dirt. Oh, it's there. Um, I am going to turn off my mirror ring or I'm going to blow my own mind. Okay. And so this is my faceted navigation here. The idea is that there are a whole lot of plant databases out there, but it's hard for people to find exactly what they're looking for. I might want to say, um, and I'd appreciate it if you don't go click this, because you will melt my server. I have one tiny little slice, right? Um, you can melt my server after this part of the talk. <laughs> so I'm going to um, click on the hardiness zone, and we're in 8B here in Austin. And maybe since um, you know the, the deer are pretty thirsty, Oh, somebody's not following that. Okay, so um, since we're in Austin and the deer are pretty thirsty, maybe I want something that's deer resistant, and maybe I want to look for things that are blooming red and yellow. Um, but the idea is, you know, as I click through this, these counts are changing. And so my searches, my search results are being narrowed um, as I go. We found that our facet menu was complex enough that... Um, if too much was open at one time, it confused the user, so we just close. When one menu opens, we close the other ones automatically. And, you know, so maybe I want something full sun. Um, and I can also, like, remove different elements of my search at any time. They all appear up here, so, you know, maybe I'm not so interested in the deer-resistant stuff, because as, as we know in Austin, deer-resistance is really a myth, right? So, um, but anyway, the ideas are that the user has multiple facets. They can drill down to any facet in any order, and you limit the choices as they go. Normally, what you'd see with a simpler facet search is this list, things would start to disappear. But in our particular implementation, it doesn't make as much sense. We do have some of the things um, down here disappear. Like if I click this, and then I go to um, you know, plant characteristics. There's certain things wouldn't show up because there aren't any plants in those categories anymore. Okay? So that's faceted navigation. And now you get to find out why it's racist. Okay. Oh, where are you? Uh, there's my new book. Okay, so I'm not seeing what you're seeing, so I've got to look over my shoulder, grab this guy, pull him down, and now we can restart. Sometimes the te my technology gets me. Okay, so there was a company called Pumpkin Labs that was asked to build a facet navigation um, site for great search engine performance for a furniture store. Small local store, um, they basically had, had a good amount of money to dedicate to marketing, and they decided to spend it in this way. So they wanted a system with that would let you pick all the different kinds, all the different, you know, different dimensions of furniture. Like you might be able to pick your color, you might be able to pick your size, the type of furniture, um, the typical user. And the idea is that as Google crawls this and starts to um, attack, attach keywords to things, you can update your URL, you can update your H1 and your page title, and you can come up with some pretty interesting combinations, some of which you might think about in advance, like a leather sofa or a teen dresser that's red. Some of those you might never conceive, like a black baby bed and a white baby bed. So these started to show up on Google, <laughs> and they started, and everybody started calling the, the CEO of Pumpkin Labs and say, you have built me a racist website, you know, when that was never the intention at all. But, but the point of, of this part of the talk is that you can get 
it's this kind of stuff with a simple facet grouping is incredible for Google because you start to get these interesting combinations that you didn't think of when, when you initially developed the site. Now, so this is what our implementation looks like. Um, the hardest part about building this system is some of the implementation is on the active, is backed by active record, and some of the implementation is backed by the session. Now, we didn't want to go all the way out to active record every time somebody expanded um, an individual um, piece of the facet. That would just be too expensive. And we, didn't, we couldn't afford to put everything in the session because it basically wouldn't fit. So we settled on an active record model um, for the individual plant. Um, so, so anyway, one of the implementations that's very common with faceted navigation is to use an index search um, like a solar or a, um, you know, a ferret or, you know, the, the hot one now is, is Sphinx, right? And, and the Rails plug-in of thinking Sphinx. But um, I knew that I wanted my plants to be able to, to be cross-linked from a, a variety of different places. So the tagging model was very important to me. So I built a, a, um, a model where every attribute on the plant was represented as a tag. So if something, something might have a tag of full sun with the context of sun exposure. So now when it's time to write an article um, that's, that's about full sun plants, I can go ahead and grab a chunk of plants, a paginated list of plants for all that rich cross-linking that um, that's all the search engines are going to love. Okay, so that's, that's my model. It's a plant with a whole lot of tags. The plant's very skinny. The tags are very skinny. Um, but, but when I'm building that facet, um, facet of navigation, when I'm counting things, I can do so very quickly. And the admin, so rather than hard code the list of facets on the left-hand side, I let my admins build it. And this looks exactly like you'd expect it to. On the left-hand side, there's the name of this thing. Like maybe it's um, soil, which has soil pH, um, and soil composition and things like that underneath it. So it's not really, it's really a, a grouping, right? Um, and then there's um, soil pH, which is a multi-value field that has values of acidic, neutral, and alkaline. And then there's um, edible, which is just a Boolean, um, which has values of yes or no. And so there's a, um, an active record model um, with all the different kinds of facets. Um, and I do this with single table inheritance, and it seems to work pretty well. Now, the facet implementation is a little bit trickier. Where does this kind of code live? Well, the logical place for user interface code to live is either in the view or in the helper, but you don't want to drop this much code in the helper. So what I actually did is um, I built object models um, for, I built an object model for this that's actually in the helper directory that's consumed by, um, by a very thin wrapper in the helper. And that method basically says, render the facet tree. And um, so, so basically, this implementation is backed by the search, which is an active record, and the session, which has things like which particular node is expanded, and things like that. So there's, there's a, um, the behavior, there's really not a lot of it. There's, it's, it's mostly just rendering and things that, re, that support the rendering process. You know, there's expand and contract, which, which saves us, um, changes the state of them a little bit. And on the, the Google API, um, changing the state basically just changes basic, um, what's, what's in the URL parameters. And um, in, in the other implementation, I actually change what's in the session. Um, you know, of course, I wanted Google to, to be able to capture the state, um, so I let, I let Google carry that state with it in the URL parameters. Okay, now the downside of this, you've probably already seen it already. Um, no matter what I did to that facet tree, Google was absolutely fascinated with it, and it would get into that facet tree and never get out. There were too many combinations. It was too rich. And, and you know, and that makes sense, right? Because you could have one, one version that's full sun, and then, um, and then you tack on um, you know, blooms in the early summer, and then you flip those parameters. Those are, that's, that's two different flows that takes you to the same place. But Google has to try all of them before it could tell. Right? So 
sadly, after all that work, we turned it off. <laughs> now, we think that the facet navigation still is part of the secret sauce of the business because you have to be able to search this plant database, which you know, right now we've only got um, 4,000 4, plants or so. By the end of the year, we'll have you know, 8 to 10. Um, but even then, that's, that's a lot of different plants, and there are a lot of different circumstances, and our database is adaptive. So, you know, you might have the experience that African daisies in your yard, well, you know, being from Canada and stuff, you know, they, they don't grow very well unless they're in full sun, you know, and you might have the experience that, you know, being from, um, from Mexico, you know, that African daisies um, can't really take the sun. The full sun will, will cook them, so you might have to have partial shade. Um, so as our database um, adapts, then um, our, our facets will play nice with that kind of model. So what we do is, is we actually expose those individual searches for things that we think that we might need to optimize for search engines. You know, for real estate, you might have, have a, um, a safe search that's, um, you know, lakefront Austin homes, right? That's, that's basically, you can, you can grab a faceted search of that and drop the URL in, in a place for, for like hot tags or whatever. We find that... Um, we're going to start experimenting with user saved searches because we think that our users want to be able to save those searches and we think that if they do, we're targeting with SEO specifically the things that our users want to do. And um, so we think that that'll help the page rank precisely in the places that we want to. And also, you know, as we grab those, that will add juice to the plants that show up in those searches too. Okay, so um, my mom says, disable the fast and ads for complex sites because it's racist. So the last part of the talk is, is about smashing mirrors, and this is um, essentially about controlling duplication. Duplication is horrible for, um, for websites because it essentially dilutes the juice. If you've got four pages that are essentially the same thing, you'd like, um, you're essentially saying, you want four search results further down, way further down, um, rather than one big, fat, good search result that's on the top. That's, that's actually the opposite of what you want. You want one page with all the juice um, poured into that, that single page. So the last, I don't know, a couple of months, I've been really trying to smash the mirrors. So I'll go into... Um, what, what search engine tools do you guys use? Anybody use analytics? Anybody use webmaster tools? Just a couple. Now, this is something you have to go get. This is really the developer end of, um, of search engines. For HTML suggestions, um, I've been watching this first purple link for, for a long time. And in this case, all 479 of those are from an earlier crawl and problems that I've already fixed. And then once it comes around again, um, it'll find other mistakes that I've made and, and there'll be more, right? But I find that one of the most valuable things that I can do is, is control the duplication. Um, and that, that first focuses Google on the pages that I want it to be crawling. And second, it, it, should, um, it should give me better juice for the long, um, in the long term. Now, duplication can show up in surprising places. One of the ones I've been thinking about is, the, um, is a comment or a rating. So on this particular page, this description stuff right here is the stuff that I really want to optimize for. I want basically a rich chunk of text that, um, that repeats some of the text that's important to me. And in this case, it's a sequoia tree. Um, and that's why it's, it's repeated twice in the H2s. But what's going to happen if I let Google crawl this and this list of comments gets longer due to pagination, is I'll start duplicating this. Does that make sense? So I'll have 17 pages. If there are 17 pages of comments, this plant page is replicated 17 times. And that would be absolutely fatal to the SEO for this particular um, application. So what I'm really watching is the ratings. Now, there are a couple of solutions none of which are perfect, but some of which are pretty promising. The one that I like the best, we're not doing this yet, but the one that I like the best is actually rendering all of your comments and using JavaScript to show and hide the various chunks of them. Now, um, 
Now, we had a search engine expert tell us that this is not going to get us busted for cloaking. That's not, cloaking is basically showing Google one thing and rendering something else. This is essentially, um, this is helping Google um, you know, with, with one particular, um, with one fetch. And um, you know, it's, it's great for SEO because I have one copy of the thing and I also get all the richness of all those comments um, fed in as well. The next thing that I can do is I can actually use Ajax, and if I wanted to, I could site map the individual comments and have a separate interface to the comments. But you know, maybe the content of the comments is not that important to you. Maybe um, to your search engine optimization, um, you know, it, it depends on the types of comments that you're getting. If you're getting really simple comments, it might not matter very much. But if your Ajax is not accessible um, and it doesn't degrade gracefully, um, this can actually be a good technique to, um, to keep Google out of where you want it. Um, one of the things that you can do is you could say, okay, um, we're not getting much juice down here at this level anyway. Um, I'm gonna bite that bullet, but I really don't want the, the duplication. So I wanna make sure that Google knows um, you know, that, that these, these are different pages and um, that my users know that these are different pages. And since the, um, the, the one without a page number is going to be shorter, the keyword density is, will be higher, and that result should show up first. Um, the solution that we use is, um, we use a robots meta tag with follow, which means go ahead and crawl these pages and pass the juice through to the individual pages. So, you know, Google is still crawling our sidebars and passing the juice to the, the places that we want them. But don't put these, don't include these extra pages in the index. And this is what that looks like. Um, so in my layout, um, you know, I have my, my header, and if, the, if there's a page parameter that's passed in and it's greater than one, um, go ahead and add a, a robots meta tag with no index in the follow. Okay, the last, last couple of things I want to talk about, um, you know, the two param solution that I showed you will lead to duplication if you change the spelling, right? So my example was, you know, I misspelled the name of my dog. Um, and, but what I would like to happen, so here's a real world example. Um, I am a hardcore dyslexic. I've written 12 books, but my wife had to edit everything, like pretty badly. Um, I actually misspelled impatience, I spelled it impatient, right? I'm also not a hardcore gardener. So that's kind of a bad combination on this site. Um, so I had a duplication, duplication that I found because when I changed the name, um, Google kept coming back to the first one, even though it's not the definitive version anymore. And the, the new second one existed and Google found that by the links on the site. And you solve that with a simple redirect. All you do is you say, okay, unless the brand's um, ID matches the plant to the parameter, then you're going to redirect back to the plant, and the problem is solved. And so normally I one line this, but for presentation purposes, um, I broke this, I broke it out like that. Now I know that we're short on time, and, and I want to set you to save time for questions, but I want to leave you with some final thoughts. If you're ever driving in Memphis, watch this lady. Okay? Um, any questions or comments? Yeah. What's that? I don't know the answer to that. Um, uh, so if you're trying to game the search engine, I would be very careful. If you're doing it um, for, for usability, um, you know, I'd, I'd probably get another opinion on that. I'd, I'd definitely ask a, a search engine expert. Other questions, comments? Okay, thank you.